We got a lot of motherboards laying around. These are the mainstream motherboards. And uh, JJ, where does the mainstream kind of fit in? Well, you know, that's a great question. You know, mainstream is really our kind of um, our stalwart kind of division, right? It's the longest running division that we have with Asus in terms of the motherboard product group. And when we go about designing, developing the boards, the feature set and the functionality is really aligned towards giving the broadest level of usability to any type of user. So whether you're an experienced user, whether you're a novice user, whether you're kind of in the middle, uh, whether you're gaming, gaming, whether you're doing content creation, general productivity, multimedia, it doesn't matter. We try to fundamentally make a board that's going to have a, a great set of feature set to complement every type of usage model. So it's really kind of a board where historically kind of the convention gets used, uh, you know, uh, jack of all trains and master of none, but we don't have that. Uh, that's something that we uh, we think that we buck the trend that in our mainstream series where we try to make it actually a master of a lot of things and actually have it really be a great experience across however you're going to utilize it. So that's kind of uh, the direction we take with it is that if you're just looking for a fantastic board, you know, cross usage uh, cross models um, or a specific usage model, you're going to have a great experience. Now these, I mean, uh, do these still have the same overclocking ability as some of the ROG boards or? Yeah, that's actually, that's a really great question. So fundamentally, you know, that's a, just a great uh, um, topic in general. So while we'll probably reinforce this point as you guys check out some of the other videos on Tough and WS and ROG, definitely from top to bottom, like we talked about last year, whether you're going to get the entry level Z uh, 97-A all the way up to the deluxe or whether it's the mini ITX Z97-I plus, they're all going to have the same exact overclocking experience. Um, so all of them, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz, it's not an issue. You can feel confident in the overclocking capability. You should buy the motherboard based off the feature set and the functionality, and ultimately the experience, not the perception that I need the deluxe to overclock, or that even the deluxe is gonna overclock better or less than a Maximus 7 Hero. This, right. So that's not the case. Uh, really the difference comes into play if we just uh, lastly finish up here from the premise of overclocking, comes into more so uh, what's the experience that you want in overclocking in relation sometimes to thermal stability? So as you know, um, you know, here's a pro as an example. If we take a look at it, it's got a really beefy, large VRM heatsink, which of course covers all the MOSFETs and the drivers, helps to keep everything really nice, cool, and efficient, whether you're at stock or whether you're overclocked, you've got these great quality inductors there, give you more than enough power component capability. But you know, if we were to take a look at something like uh, the Deluxe, for instance, if a uh, just go ahead and just kind of move yeah, it here it in frame. Yeah, you, can see it there. Uh, you can see that we've got even a larger heatsink assembly that actually has a centered heat pipe that goes into a second block, right? And uh, these inductors are actually our higher amperage inductors. So these are 60 amp rated inductors, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get necessarily better overclocking capability, but what it does mean is that you might have better thermal efficiency. Right. So what I mean by that is just that this board might run a little bit hotter than the deluxe board even though they can both essentially uh, have the same overclocking capability. So if you're somebody that just, you know, you care about making sure your board's running a little bit cooler, right. right, a little bit more efficiently, maybe you have a little bit more power delivery left in the tank as you push the platform, that's where the difference is going to come into play. But it's not a question that the Dash A is going to be inferior to the overclocking experience of the Deluxe. It's just going to come down to, you know, overall the maximum power delivery capability and thermal efficiency. And that would even hold true, same thing on ROG, where ROG, they even have higher end components. Right. So with those higher end components, the thermal efficiency might even be a little bit better but it's not a question that you're never going to not have an outstanding experience on overclocking all right all right so let's take a look at this one uh, what do we have right here so here we've got the z97 pro and uh this is kind of be the board that we're kind of really just highlight overall to give you guys a sense of what we've done for this generation on the features and functions and while we might not necessarily call out specifically the deluxe or the z97 a or even our mini itx board as a whole a lot of the features and functionality are unilaterally going to be consistent across these boards like we've talked about in the past like yeah. we've got non-negotiables you know so things like the fan controls or, or other aspects are going to be consistent. And the Pro kind of fits somewhere in the middle of this line. And yeah, then... it's kind of right there square yeah. in the middle. It's yeah. kind of in that comparable class to where our Maximus um, 7 Hero is going to be, our Sabre 2 Z97. So it's right there in kind of that middle band where a lot of you guys are looking at it at or around kind of a little bit the $200-ish price point on a board. Uh, so not at the highest end price point, not at the lowest end, but kind of right there in the middle. So you're not necessarily getting more features when you step up. You're getting more connectivity and more options that way, but you guys still have the same suite yeah, the, of, yeah, the, of software. The, the, the core and, functionality and experiences you yeah. can get, we aim to have that be consistent across the board. So like you said, the differences will be more into, um, you know, as we'll talk about, it might be something like SAT Express. This board has SAT Express. Well, the Deluxe has even more SAT Express, right? right? Or more USB 3, uh, but it won't be necessarily on the key functionality and the experience. All right. So if we take a look here just at the top section of the board, we've got this great VRM heatsink like we talked about, and all the boards are going to have great quality power delivery. They're going to have high performance MOSFETs, drivers, inductors. Um, some improvements that we've made for this generation 
on both the Pro and the Deluxe, we have 10K rated capacitors that we used to only have on the Tough and the RG series. Right. They're now on here. Uh, the Dash A will still maintain the 5K rated capacitors, but overall still great quality power delivery solution. Now, one other thing, if we just take a look at a general aesthetic of the board, you'll see that this is also new for this generation. We've gone ahead and refined, and overall, I think, given a, a clean, modern kind of styling to the gold that we previously introduced. And we've just gone with a little bit of a different accenting, where we've got a more of an almost monochromatic color scheme, right, where we go with the black on the PCB, and then we have a, a black for the accent, and then a secondary accent with a dark gray. So that goes for the PCIe, for the DRAM, and for the SATA. It's, it's a different shade of gold compared to the last time Yeah, it's, as a, well. it's a softer yeah. gold, you know, and I think it accents really well. It looks clean, looks nice, and uh, you'll also see that on the mainstream series, we've gone ahead and incorporated what we call our concentric circle design. Uh, so this is just something we've brought over some of our other design teams, and it adds, a, I think, a little bit more of kind of a, a classy kind of clean look to the board. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Um, so, and, that, and that's something, like I said, you'll see throughout the, the, the mainstream series. We, we, we're getting all Martha Stewart here on this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of people were complaining about the aesthetic. On the other board, I don't think the, the shade of gold was really hitting. I, I never judge a product mm -hmm. based on the aesthetic, so I always allow... You know, users, it, that's really something that's subjective. So, yeah, uh, I actually liked the gold even more in the previous generation. Uh, where I think the biggest improvement has come is that one, I think there's always going to be some. Um, difference of opinion when you go from such a consistent color that we had with blue for so many years and we make a big change to something as dramatic as gold. Yeah. And then the accent colors, right, with yellow and brown might have been, I think, visually jarring to some people in addition to the gold. So I think gold might have not necessarily been the the immediate traction, but right. in complement with those, those Well, what colors. you need to do is you, you got to build like a little nook yeah. and then you frame it in the nook with some <laughs> <laughs> country but, home type stuff, you know, wood plant, never mind. Back, back to the actual back, back, back to the hardware, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, moving over to the board, of course, you know, fan control connectivity is a big thing that we've always messaged. And last year, you know, we talked a lot about Fan Expert 2 right. and all the functionality we had. So this generation, we actually have Fan Expert 3. So this is awesome. We've taken fan controls to an entirely new level. So all the boards here uh, you're going to see, we all have nothing but four pin fan headers, right? right? So that's same as last generation. Three pin and four pin control, same as last generation. So where's the improvement come in? Some really big under the hood improvements. So we have a new topology layout that's giving us the ability to have true output signal control per each header for DC or PWM output. So the advantage of this is that in previous generations we could control three pin and four pin fans, right. but we didn't have the ability to control the output signal to map it to either being DC or PWM oriented. Now why is this important? One, giving you the ability to output specifically to PWM is even gonna give you more granularity and how the fan respond curves if you have a PWM fan. But even cooler is if you've seen some of the new chassis on the market, like an example like an NZXT uh, Source 530 or the 440 um, yeah. or you know the carbide like 500R, stuff like that, you can have like seven to 10 fans inside that chassis. Well, what happens is the motherboard only has six fan headers, so you can't actually connect that many, right? But what you can now go ahead and do oh, nice. is... Oh, nice. see where um, we're going with this. Yeah. If you want to, say, go ahead and take this chassis fan header on this board, uh, you know, or this chassis fan header right here, you could go ahead and use a PWM splitter cable, attach that, and now when it's set to PWM output, that splitter cable could give you three, four more leads, and mm. all those cables will now receive that same control signal. So even though those ca those fans uh, will be powered by the power supply, not by the motherboard, all the fans will receive the control signal from the board. So now all of a sudden, you can imagine, like I said, on that Source 530, you have right. three intake fans. All three of those intake fans could be controlled by that signal uh, header. And in total, you could have, like I said, nine fans nice. controlled, all tuned, all calibrated. So it's a really awesome advanced feature when you think about the control flexibility where you could have, you know, a splitter here and a splitter here for guys that really right. want to get crazy about cooling and just be able to have it also ultimately accessible, right? Because you don't have to have another fan bay controller or have different types of control functions. You can always make sure that whether in the UEFI or in the OS, you have all that fan control functionality. So that's awesome. But we didn't stop there. We even took it even further. <laughs> Wait, there's more type stuff? There's more. So <laughs> an right. awesome function that we also introduced here is something that we've gone ahead and leveraged from the Sabertooth division mm -hmm. uh, of motherboards that we have under our Tough series. And we gave you more granularity at how to define temperature input mapping. So what I mean by that is historically every single fan header on the motherboard. So if we look at, you know, CPU, CPU optional, and then chassis fan, chassis fan. Well, actually they all responded to the CPU temperature. And that's not necessarily bad, but it's actually, in, in some ways, it's coarse because sometimes, let's say, right. this chassis fan, which might be your intake to draw against, uh, let's say, the, um, the uh, storage array, 
you might not necessarily want it to respond to the CPU temperature. You might your CPU might not be doing a lot of work, but maybe your storage array is receiving more consistent volume, and you want that to be based off a different temperature. Well, guess what? Now you're going to have the ability to do this. We're giving you the ability that you can go ahead and map any header on the board to the VRM temperature, to the PCH temperature, to motherboard temperature, or even an optional temp sensor. So the Deluxe and the Pro, not the Dash A, the Dash A will have all the other temperature points to be discussed, yeah. but not this optional temp sensor. But if I just show you right here, we've got this little optional temp sensor. You'll plug that there into the bottom of the board, and then you can go ahead and put this on your SSD, your mechanical hard drive, maybe on the back of your GPU, maybe you want to put in a portion of your chassis. Well, guess what? Wherever you want, it's a, it's a flexible temperature point, right? But you can have that now as a mappable point. So now any single one of these fan headers can respond to different values. So, you know, if you want this back fan to respond to the VRM, CPU is going to respond to the CPU temperature. Right. This is going to respond to the PCH. And maybe this, you know, bottom fan is going to respond to the motherboard temperature. It's an insane level of granularity and control that if you thought what we had in last generation was awesome, and we still keep all those functions. We're right. still giving you the ability to have the full automatic fan calibration. We're still giving you the ability to rename every single header. This is some pretty insane stuff that we've now integrated in. And once again, even going down to our entry level Dash A board, you're going to have that class of fan control. So pretty awesome stuff. Nice. Um, now, wrapping it up, we still even add a little bit more in terms of the fan control functionality where we've gone ahead and integrated, uh, and we'll show it a, a little bit later on in one of the demos, uh, but we have fan tuning built into the UVFI. So while definitely the richest experience will come from you still using mm -hmm. Fan Expert 3 in the OS, for you guys that want to do it purely in the uh, in the UEFI environment, you can go in there and run the full fan calibration profile. And we also have given you graphical fan tuning inside the UEFI as really? well. Really? Okay. So I remember last time you could go in and you could just set like a percentage based upon. Yeah, it was the very right? very detailed, right? And yeah. we actually even opened it up more this generation. This generation, uh, you have minimum. Uh, middle and maximum, so not min and maximum. So you have three points of granularity mm -hmm. in terms of the temperature target and the fan RPM rotation and being able to sign whether the fan even stops. So just all the way around, just huge upgrade to the fan control I mean, that, that's good for a lot of people who, um, I mean, some people are crazy about having like nothing in the, in the, in the, in the tray. You yeah. know what I mean? Like sure. I don't want anything running in the background. I, I run it in the background because it, it, it helps the, the sound profile quite a bit, especially yep. with the editing rig because mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot of fans and um, it, it brought the noise level down by like 80% because a lot of times the fans were just blowing yeah. way too hard. Yeah. So um, being able to do that in the UEFI for, for a lot of the people who, you know, like I said, don't, don't want to mess around with having 10 things running at the same time in the background. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice option. I mean, for us, you know, we still think that, um, you know, we've designed the program to be lightweight, responsive, and accessible so that it doesn't impact your system yeah. experience. But we want to give you guys the control flexibility of trying to do as much. It's difficult. Keep this in mind. It's really hard because we're almost duplicating to a degree of redundant level of functionality because since we've already done it in the OS layer, we're having to go back and backport into the UEFI when we could be prioritizing other things which might even be more exciting, more interesting. But you know, uh, we're trying to give you guys the best balance of accessibility. There's a funny question. Can you confuse it if you were to go into the UEFI and set a bunch of stuff and then also try to use Fan Expert 3? No, or just one? yeah, it, it will, uh, the OS layer will always supersede what you define within okay. the UEFI environment. But what you initially have defined within the UEFI will be active until you were to find something else in the OS layer. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's been a big improvement that we've made there. Now, moving down here on the kind of just the side of the board, um, you know, I've never been the biggest fan of onboard switches because once you put um, a board inside of a chassis, you can't use them. Right. But for first time builders, when you're sometimes uh, using the board, there are things that we can do to improve the experience. So we still keep things like the memo K button, which is that one touch option to be able to troubleshoot and resolve uh, memory initialization issues or maybe failing dims. Yeah, or I, I can, use it as a soft CMOS clear. Yeah, that's actually a perfect example is you can use it to sometimes just reset frequency, timing, and voltages as opposed to losing all your other settings yeah, like fan me. settings or SATA operation and all kinds mm -hmm. of other stuff. But directly below that is a new feature that we've introduced, which is the easy XMP switch. So for users, still based on all our market data, we're seeing almost close to 50% of users forget to enable XMP or they don't know how to do it. Right. And so they just run the, the, the RAM at, at, at the, the JDEC. Yeah, yeah, the whatever. JDEC SPD profile. Yeah, so now the motherboard says. when the user just or goes ahead and drops in the, demo, uh, drops in the, the dims, uh, they can just flip that into the on position, and that's it. The board will automatically enable the XMP profile for you. So a super simple process for users that uh, you know just want to run stock but want to at least be able to go ahead and get that full benefit of whatever right. the memory is that they purchase. And what if there's multiple XMP settings? Will it, it will default okay. to the primary XMP profile, not the secondary. So um, right now I think the only vendor that I'm seeing that does two-stage XMP is Kingston. Yeah. Pretty much every other vendor is only using one XMP profile. So if you got a Kingston kit of memory, they usually do two because in some situations it's rare but the XMP profile may not be supported 
uh, because it might be too aggressive. So they're just giving you kind of a secondary safe XMP that's still higher than the baseline uh, uh, SPD. Know, with some of the kinks, sometimes I, I've found that if you sometimes do the secondary one or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, the cast latency will be so much lower or yeah. whatever, even though the frequency is lower, that you'll end up getting slightly more bandwidth. Like, yeah, it, it's bit more. depending on, you know, on the latency and the timing value. So sometimes there is that situation as well. But here, but not you know, ultimately just make the, the process a little bit more seamless for you, right? So moving down from there, we've got uh, now for this generation on the Pro, dual front USB 3. Uh, so that's nice. Some of the newer chassis on the market are starting yep. to have front, two front USB 3 ports. We've got a couple of them in here, and yeah. we were complaining, like, well, there's no motherboards. What, yeah, what do we do? It, so now we've gone ahead and integrated that. Or for editing guys yep. or, uh, you know, content creation guys, you can run a, a card reader, high-speed card reader, mm -hmm. and then your front USB 3. Plus, of course, these maintain USB 3 boost support, as well as things like USB charger plus, so you can quick charge, you know, uh, things like your mobile phones or your tablets or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We move down here to the storage array configuration, and we've got something that's pretty cool. Maybe I can go ahead and give you a little, guys, yeah, a little bit of a, a side profile there. There we go, yep. Perfect. And you can see right there that we've got SATA Express. So that's a brand new type of interconnect. Now, this is backwards compatible so that if you don't use it as SATA Express, you have two SATA 6G ports. Um, but if you use a light in SATA Express, if you want to go ahead and maybe uh, show them here our a SATA Express cable. Yeah, that's this is actually, a weird looking cable. That's the cable that you would be interfacing with. So you have one SATA Express port. And I, I know you were digging this guy out, which is our going to be a uh, little item that we're going to be coming out with, which is called the Hyper Express. So the Hyper Express will be a little module that allow you to go ahead and open it up, put in either two M.2 SSDs or uh, two M SATA based SSDs. It'll hardware raid them. You can plug it in there and then be able to have faster than single SSD based performance if you want to be able to take advantage of the SATA Express interface. So it's a simple, you know, just easy accessible option. You don't have to worry about uh, configuring anything. Just go ahead and drop it in. You're good to go. Now, how fast is this compared to doing a raid yourself with two SATA ports? Two SATA ports is still going to actually have higher throughput because mm -hmm. not because of limitation of the SATA Express standard in itself, but more so the limitation of the uh, raid controller that we have have integrated on the Hyper, uh, Hyper Express. So depending on the SSDs that you use on there, you could peak up to maybe about uh, 825 to about 850 megabytes sequential performance. Right, but of you're course, not going to get up to 1,000 like you would with two. Correct, on know. the PCH, yeah. yes. So it's still pretty interesting. I mean, if you're someone who's you know intimidated by RAID. Yeah, if you're looking for a, a simple streamlined solution, it's a great option in terms of just being able to drop them in there, sting it into a single slot, and you're good to go. And it also only takes up um, you know one 2.5 inch. Correct. Uh, slot. It's just it's just pretty much like installing a single SSD, yeah, except that you have two SSDs in there. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a cool little accessory, and we'll be coming out with that in probably about a month's time. It should be released uh, and available to you guys, so you can check out your favorite e-tailer or whatever it might be. Cool. Um, so directly below that, of course, we've got our standard uh, PCH-based connectivity. We have an add-in AS Media 1061 SATA 60 controller as well to complement that. And then, uh, excuse look me, out. rounding that out, if we take a look once again there on the bottom, we've got the M.2 base connection. So with M.2, um, that's going to be both supported of M.2 SATA and M.2 PCIe. So either one's going to be supported, but just keep in mind, like I said, if you connect to the M.2 and you use a M.2 SSD that's SATA base, you're going to lose some PCH connectivity. Uh, if you use uh, M.2 PCIe, uh, like uh, the new Plex store uh, based uh, M.2 SSD is a pure PCIe solution, that will give you the highest throughput and the best performance. So yeah. that gives you that. Now directly below that, we've got uh, two different TPU switches. We have one uh, TPU is, of course, you flip it in this direction. Uh, two stages, one will just do multiplier tuning, the other will do BCLK tuning. Uh, and that's just for one touch overclocking up to like about 4.3 gigahertz for users that just want a simple, easy, accessible solution. And that's with uh, 4.3, that's with like a 4770K or with uh, yeah, yeah. future Intel CPU as well, or I don't, I don't know. Um, the rules actually will vary. So, you know, depending on next generation CPUs, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll predefined what we feel is uh, probably about at least a 90% hit rate on those CPU space solutions. Uh, but they'll probably, we would expect them to be probably in that same range. Right. Um, the EPU switch right next to it is in the opposite direction. If you guys don't want to overclock, you want to run stock, but you want a little bit better power efficiency, lower temperatures, just flip that on in, and that just does an undervolt to the CPU. But it doesn't affect performance. So it's uh, either you know stock and power efficiency and thermal performance power consumption, mm -hmm. or in the other direction, you can go towards higher frequency, better performance. All right. I don't know how that works, man. Like, how do you... Lower the voltage and not affect performance. I mean, I uh, guess you're running at the same frequency, but... Yeah, exactly, because we don't modify the frequency. What we've found is that there's always a margin within the CPU uh, that allows actually for a little bit less voltage to be driven to mm -hmm. it um, and maintain the same exact frequency. 
So that's that's uh, how we're achieving what we're doing there with that EPU switch. So moving along from there, you can see that we've got uh, a lot of connectivity options down here at the bottom. Like I said, the secondary front USB 3, you got an onboard power button. You got the USB BIOS flashback button, which is an awesome option for you guys in terms of just being able to have a hardware button so that if you go ahead and press that button, you plug in uh, a flash drive into the corresponding USB port, you can directly update the motherboard's uh, UEFI right here with no CPU, no memory, no graphics card. All you need is the power connected to the motherboard, and that's it. Uh, it also works great in the event that maybe you have like a surge, spike, brownout, mm -hmm. sag, or something like that, and uh, the board's maybe UEFI becomes corrupted. You can also use that to recover the board even if it doesn't post. Um, but absolute worst case scenario, like you were talking to me about earlier, this is a non-soldered on base solution. Yes. So in the event uh, that you know none of those solutions work, including our USB BIOS flashback, which would be pretty rare, you could still contact our service support department and they could send you out a new chip, swap it in there, and bam, you're up and running as opposed to having to send the board in right. because it's soldered and you're kind of stuck. Now, we move over here. This is a new connection, but it's something that we offered in the previous generation. If we go ahead and just uh, bring this little accessory over here, We've got, uh, go. oh, yeah, you, you I'll grab it. Grab it. We've got our uh, Thunderbolt uh, second generation, so the Thunderbolt EX2 card. So all the Z97 boards essentially will support this guy right here, which is the Thunderbolt EX2 card. So if you guys want to be able to have ultra high speed IO, so you have that uh, best in class performance, especially for content creation guys or guys looking at yep. large, uh, big time, real time backup stuff like that, it's a great easy add in option if you want to be able to enable Thunderbolt on the board. Now, going over to this section of board is one of the biggest additions that we've made, and we've brought over the isolated sound design that we had on ROG exclusively, and we've now put that onto the mainstream series of boards. So we keep the, the same expectation of what you had in the past, the isolated audio path. We have the Nichicon audio capacitors, full shielding for the audio codec, and we have an operational amplifier. Now, what we'll show a little bit later in the demo, though, is we've made some really cool experience-based improvements. Uh, we worked very closely with the DTS group, and what we did is we actually had optimized parameters, uh, sonic parameters defined for in-ear monitors, over-the-ear headphones, and desktop speakers. Mm -hmm. So when you go ahead and plug in either to the front headphone or to the line level out, you'll see actually an icon that pops on the screen that shows you a picture of either in-ear, over-the-ear, or desktop speakers. When you go ahead and select that, it will adjust essentially uh, that new profile that we work with the DTS group on. And in addition to that, there'll actually be three different ARIO profiles that are defined for music, movies, and games that you can enable as well. I've been actually uh, been pretty impressed with it. So it's a pretty cool new function that we've introduced outside of the hardware-based improvements that we have here on the board as well. For the audio files, do you know what the op amp is on this one? Um, uh, we'll go ahead and detail that in the spec sheet. This is a Texas okay. Instruments op uh, operation amplifier. It's actually an entirely new one uh, built in for this generation that is giving us the ability to matrix out this functionality from either here and here. Now, but that is actually a good point though. Just speaking on op amps, you know, we've been designing uh, sound cards longer than any of the competitors which don't even have sound card divisions. And we have a really good understanding of a lot of different aspects on audio. And um, one thing is some people wonder about, well, you, you might ask, well, uh, is it swappable? We don't actually uh, choose to put in swappable based op amps, specifically for the reason actually most audio gear won't give you that ability. Now, we've had sound cards that we've produced that do give you that ability, All but right. it's important to understand that when you design an entire audio chain, that the audio chain is generally tuned and maximized for a specific op amp. And if you change it, while you can conditionally change some of the tonality experience of it, it might be that the entire actually audio path is not ideally matched to that op amp. Um, it's very similar that even if you go back to like tubes, not all tubes, even though if you can go ahead and drop in a different tube into a different app, should be dropped into that configuration. So it's a question that we feel um, that overall the entire sound design is really designed and matched up to the op amp that's been selected. For really audio files, which I consider myself, you know, I'm somebody that I actually buy HD source material, you know, right. um, and I don't even uh, purchase compressed bass music. Um, if you're really listening on an ultra high grade set of audio headphones or desktop monitor class speakers, then we usually find that they're not even going to still be satisfied even with this solution. And they're looking to actually go with a discrete class, either like a DAC solution or an add-in sound card. Um, so moving up to here in terms of the back IO connectivity, we've got a lot of good stuff going on here. All the stuff that you would expect, you know, if we just uh, go ahead and flip the board right over here, you're going to see that we've got all the IO that you would expect, you know, USB 3, USB 2, gigabit, Ethernet. Uh, the Pro's been upgraded from the previous generation to have 8 or 11 AC wireless with Bluetooth. So that was previously only offered on the deluxe board. Now, some cool stuff that we've done, we still maintain the focus on Intel Ethernet as we feel that's the best performance, best management NIC out there that's on the market. Uh, but we have a new Turboland software that replaces our um, network eye control. So the cool thing about Turboland is that it can work in conjunction to packet prioritize for you know, voice over IP, downloading, browsing, streaming, whatever it might be, for both the physical NEC 
as well as the wireless adapter. So it's agnostic, it doesn't care. Even if you add in your own PCI wireless adapter or your USB wireless adapter, you can still prioritize and take advantage of TurboLAN versus some competitors on the market might be using a NIC that's exclusively prioritizing just the physical NIC. And if you're using another form of connection, then you get no ability to be able to do packet prioritization. So that's another benefit. Now, uh, going back to the USB 3 ports, of course, um, just like those front ports that we discussed, we got the USB 3 boost and USB um, charger plus functionality that we discussed. So overall, tons of connectivity that you have there and that you're able to work with on the board. Now, rounding out some cool functionality, while they don't come with the Pro board, uh, we've made some cool new additions for this generation. And so is that NFC? Yes. So this is the NFC Express box, which we introduced uh, last generation. <laughs> there we go. And uh, the cool thing about the NFC Express box for this generation, we've added new functionality. So you still maintain the ability to quick log on to your OS. You can, of course, do a photo transfer. In addition to that, you can do quick launch of applications. Um, but we've also now added the ability this generation to do streaming support. So if you play back a video, excuse me, a video file from your mobile device or your tablet, and you put it on there, it can stream directly to your desktop. Oh, and you can also do Bluetooth audio streaming as well. So if you're playing back an audio file, you can go ahead and stream that as well directly to your desktop speakers. That's so pretty cool. some pretty awesome new functionality we've integrated. Plus you get a USB pass-through hub as well. So all the way around you get some improvements. And we also now have this new little accessory, which is Qi wireless charging. So if you want to be able oh, to have cool. wireless charging support for your phone, you can go ahead and easily integrate that. Now how does the Qi uh, plug in, just USB? Uh, USB, but there also is a power adapter that comes included with it. So mm -hmm. however you want to be able to go ahead and set it up and enable it on your board, you're good to go. You're good to go. Now the last part that we're going to have, we're actually going to go through a lot more on the demo portion, so you guys are going to want to check that out. But we have an entirely brand new fiber optimization suite. So a lot of you guys walked away really impressed with the four optimization and auto tuning that we had last generation. Yep. This generation, we've done it all, and we've really improved on a huge amount of functionality. So you guys are want to check out the video, but you still have real-time dynamic auto overclocking with brand new options to allow you to do temperature-based target, CPU-based target, adjustment intervals, memory-based testing, and a lot more. You guys are going to really be blown away by what you can do there. Uh, Fan Expert 3, even more functionality, and we have a brand new function called app tuning. This is going to be application-specific profiling overclocking. So you're going to be able to define overclock profiles to any application you want to dynamically switch in and out of these programs. So you could imagine opening up Adobe Premiere, having it open up to 4.6 gigahertz on all cores, right? Or Battlefield 4, have it go all core frequency, and we can even automatically adjust your network prioritization and your audio prioritization. Audio prioritization. Uh, so you're going to be able to go Battlefield 4, set the network latency to high, so the, excuse me, uh, network prioritization to high, so you have low latency. <laughs> Turn the latency all the yeah. way up. <laughs> uh, and low ping, and you can automatically change the audio profile to game. Um, right. So, and then you can imagine you switch into Adobe Lightroom, that's mm -hmm. only single threaded. So instead of doing 4.6 on all threads, you could have 4.8 on a single thread, and then from there, you know, if you wanted maybe, uh, you know, to listen to some music playback, same thing, you could switch the audio preset into music versus having it be in a game. So some pretty crazy stuff that right now might not fully sink in, uh, but some really awesome functionality we've done. Is that only going to work with K parts, or is that also going to do some BLK overclocking for the non-K parts? You could go ahead and do this uh, through technically through BCLK, but uh, how we've defined app tuning, it's best experience when achieved through multiplier-based overclocking. Yeah. And we're also linking it in to a degree with the auto-tuning experience, <laughs> which while it can offer both overclocking through BCLK and through the ratio, generally I would recommend using ratio-based tuning as opposed to BCLK. Yeah, but you need a, you need a K part for that. I'm asking because I, yes. I have the uh, 1230, uh, the 1230 version 3 is a Xeon part. Yes. And that, that you actually can overclock it. I got you have a little four, bit of margin, yeah. I got it to 4 gigahertz, but I wasn't seeing any improvement in games. It was throwing back some errors and that sort of yeah. thing. But I was seeing improvements as far as the speed in my productivity applications yeah. go. So this could be something that would work for that. Yes, entirely. It's still possible. If you do, do want to do BCLK tuning on the part and still have this access to this app tuning function, app tuning just like TPU and uh, Fan Expert and EPU and all our functions can always be run independently of the entire five-way optimization suite. Yep. So overall, yeah, um, that gives you guys some of the new th functions and features, and we've even done more where we have new improvements to the UEFI and some awesome new software functions, once again, that we're going to demo. Uh, to recap, just on give you an idea on some of those, we've got push notice, real-time uh, notification of temperatures, voltages, and fan speeds in the event that you have an issue. You can receive a uh, kind of like a text message on your mobile device, even outside your home, so you don't have to be in your local network. You got cellular Wi-Fi connection, bam, you're good to go. Um, media I, mean, I just hired somebody to sit there and stare at my computer all day. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to pay that guy anymore who just sits no, there and watches it no, while I go no. out and have fun. He's I'm like, sorry, you're going to have to have him over a pink slip, man. Um, <laughs> He's fired. He's replaced by machines. <laughs> He's been replaced by drones, man. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> in addition to that, we've also got Media Streamer, which is an awesome new program. Same thing, works not only in your intranet, but in your extranet environment, where you can stream your music, movies, and games. And we'll have a really cool demo to do, excuse me, music, movies, and images. Uh, and Home Cloud, which is also going to allow you to mount your C volume directly available in the cloud. You don't have to upload to anybody else's server and you can access your content dynamically on the fly. You can share links, you can drag and drop files as well as you can also stream directly from there. So is this extranet and internet? Extranet and internet as well. So <laughs> overall some pretty awesome functionality that we're introducing that keep in mind is gonna be a staple on all of these mainstream series boards uh, even though we've highlighted uh, these functions and features here on the Pro. So overall, whether you're gonna be gaming, content creation, general productivity, uh, multimedia usage, I think the Pro is gonna make an awesome board along whether it's gonna be the Dash A or the Dolly or uh, the, even the Dash I Plus. I have one more question about this one. Just you know, this board in particular, we've got a lot of uh, you know PCI Express uh, mm -hmm. expansion laws. Does this have PLX on board? No, uh, no that's, so that's a good question. So pretty much almost just like previous generation, all Z97 boards, you pretty much have uh, SLI and Crossfire-based support. Same thing, Dash A mm -hmm. will support that. Uh, the PLX, we generally reserve um, one on, of course, the WS for three-way and four-way, and as well as multiple PCIe connectivity for things like right. adding cards. Um, the Deluxe, though, to note, doesn't use a PLX, but it uses a multiplexing chip from a different company, AS Media, so that it does allow for more concurrent PCIe connectivity. That is an important distinction. Hey, we, um, we, you know, there's not a lot of lanes here compared right. to Socket 2011. If right. you want to run 15 graphics cards and three cats or whatever, <laughs> you know, just if you want everything plugged into the bus, then you're going to need... Yeah, well, you know, in most situations, most users are never going to saturate the total total number of PCIe lanes uh, active on something like a, um, a Pro. But if we quickly look here, you're gonna see in this little area, if we took a look here, at um, our deluxe board. Our deluxe actually features this little guy over here in this section, which oh, gives you more uh, lane assignment. So what that's gonna be is that multiplexing chip is gonna give you the ability, like the deluxe has two Intel NICs, right? More SATA Express connectivity, and overall more total connections available on the board. So what that means if you're running like SLI or Crossfire, plus actively utilizing the two NICs and other adding controllers, you could keep more of those active devices. So even though the deluxe doesn't give you three-way or four-way support like the WS might, you still actually have more concurrent PCI active link connectivity than you would have something like on the Pro or the Dash A. All right, I'm glad I asked that because I think a lot of our users uh, we'll go for something like the Pro, but we have a lot of power users as well yeah. who probably... Where the Deluxe is a great option yeah. that not only do you get a higher class of board with even more connectivity, but you also have one of those really critical kind of uh, not so easily understood features like that multiplexing chip that isn't a three-way or four-way multiplexing chip like what you're going to have on the WS board, right. which gives you that ability to drive three-way or four-way or you know have even uh, a significantly more add-in PCI uh, devices. Cool. All right, so um, you guys can click on the screen. We've got some links here for you. Uh, check out all the new technology. Check out all the new software. Check out the uh, <laughs> what, the uh, uh, the push. Yeah, push notice notification. Check, check out all that stuff, guys. Just go check it all out. And I think right now it's time for us to talk about the uh, the Tough series. Yeah, let's jump into Tough. So we'll see you guys in the next video. Mm -hmm.